Well, welcome everyone. So good to have you as ever. Welcome to Redland Church Online. If I haven't met you before, my name's Will. I'm Vicar here at Redland. Um, really excited for you to join us today. A few things kind of before we kick off in worship. Like we're still running Alpha. Um, we've been, uh, we're now kind of coming up to week, oh gosh, week three on Alpha and it is going so well. We have an amazing, really fun group of guests. There's about 20 of us. We had three people signed up just last week, one person signed up even this week, um, and there's still an opportunity. If you have uh, friends who want to join or if maybe you want to join, do sign up, do join us. It's an amazing opportunity just to discuss the big questions of life in a really safe space um, through the kind of uh, Christian framework. So do be praying for that, um, do be inviting for that. Um, we'd love people to join us. Um, exciting news this week. Um, Will and Karen Davey, who many of you know, Will is one of our ordinands, part of our team here, um, who's you know, trained to be a vicar. They've had their very first baby, yes. Um, another one joining the club, uh, Sarah Grace. I believe she weighed in at seven pounds, three ounces for people who know what that means and um, understand that, she, which basically means she's just really nice and tiny and diddy and, and sweet and she's really cute. Here's a little picture. Um, so really, really, excited for them, do be praying for them and sending them a massive congratulations. I'm sure they're gonna have a lot of fun with that. Um, we're wanting to up the ante with prayer. And so the way we're kind of just, in a, just a little way of doing that is we're gonna make our prayer meetings for the next sort of season monthly. Um, the next one of those is coming on the 17th of February. There's details and a link to join in with that on our email. That'll come out again on our email, um, you know, uh, in, the, in the lead up to that. Um, to that meeting, but we would love, just as a church, to be just getting on our knees in prayer. Like when we pray, it changes stuff. Um, and if we want to see our church change, if we want to change, we've got to come before God and seek Him, seek His kingdom, to think, seek His kind of heavenly realities that we might see them on earth. We're going to worship God together now. We're going to worship Him in song. And when we come to worship God in song, we're not just singing songs because it's nice. Um, or because it's jolly, or because it makes us feel good, or, or because it sort of reminds us, it's like, you know, teaching to music. Like, worship is a, is, a, is a prophetic act. It's a spiritual act where as we worship, we enter into God's presence and we are changed. Where we worship and, and we declare the truths of who he is over ourselves, over kind of the people around us, that we, we see him. And when we see him, we are changed by him. And so let's just take a moment now to just prepare our hearts to worship God. I just invite you to just be quiet. If there's things bubbling around in your mind, just listen to Jesus. If there's a job that's nagging at you that you don't want to forget, just Make a note of it on your phone or a pad of paper so you can just forget about it for the moment. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. You are worthy of all our praise. And we want to praise you now with all that we are. We want to worship you now with all that we are. And as we worship you, Lord, I pray because we need it that we will see you, that we will know you, that we will be changed by you. Come Holy Spirit and change us now as we praise your name together as your church in scattered rooms across this city and, and nation. Come be with us, I pray. Amen. Let's worship him together.
As I was preparing our confession, one of the things I felt like God said to us was that he really wanted for us to take time to just be still before him and allow him to speak to us. That that this was a time for us to prepare our hearts for all that God has for us today and for the week. That it's not just another moment for us to go through the motions, but really for us to be still before him that before we continue on in worship and, and hear the word and pray, for us to be able to take a moment in the midst of maybe there's chaos around us or maybe there is, um, maybe there isn't chaos, but it's just the normal day that we have in lockdown. But that God really wants us to take this moment to come before him and prepare our hearts because he wants to speak to us today. He wants to show us some things. So let's take this moment and be quiet before him. Prepare our hearts. Let him speak to us right now before we say our confession so that we're ready to take in all that God has for us. So let's let's be silent before him right now. So we confess together, God our Father, long-suffering, full of grace and truth. You create us from nothing and give us life. You give your faithful people new life in the water of baptism. You do not turn your face from us, nor cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbor. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son and bring us to heavenly joy. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Hands up if you have read Pilgrim's Progress. Well, I can see a few hands are up there. It's a great book. 
And um, those of you who don't know, it's about Pilgrim, who's on his way, he's on a pilgrimage to the celestial city. And at one point, he's with his friend Hopeful, and they are caught and incarcerated by this uh, awful character called Giant Despair, who throws them into his own dungeon, his own prison, and chains them up in this dark and stinking prison. And they are beaten up regularly, and in fact they, they fear that they may never escape, and they may, they may perish in Giant Despair's dungeon. And at one point, Bunyan, John Bunyan the writer, has Pilgrim describe the experience as being one where darkness is, or words to this effect, or darkness is his closest friend in Giant Despair's dungeons. Now, John Bunyan himself was no stranger to being unjustly incarcerated and chained up, spent many years in prison, so he knew the, the despair of being in, in, in a dark and smelly dungeon. He also knew what it was to feel as though sometimes darkness was his closest friend. But he also knew that he was quoting words from our chapter today, which is Psalm 88, because Psalm 88 ends with those very words, darkness is my closest friend. And it's an extraordinary psalm. It stands alone in the book of Psalms, Psalm 88, among even among the laments or the psalms, as they're sometimes called, of disorientation, because it describes this incredibly bleak world that the author finds himself in. And we know that the author is a, is a he, and his name is Heman the Ezraite. We just know his name. We don't know much about him. It's a dark world and there's no obvious way out for him. There's no vindication or resolution or rescue. There's no closure in this bleak psalm. And it's incredibly pared down to the essentials, so that when you read it, you feel as though there's nowhere to go. You're hemmed in as you read this psalm. But it's also, I think, really important that we find a psalm or a chapter like this in the Bible. Because Psalm 88 stares reality in the face, and the writer is honestly confronting God about what's happening to him, with strong emotion, with this incredibly real anguish, authentic anguish, and strong anger. And there's no dodging it, because the author is pinning everything on God. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness, or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbour. Darkness is my closest friend. 
We're going to look at this psalm from two perspectives. First of all, from the perspective of Heman, the author, when we're going to look a little bit at the text itself. But the other way, and really importantly, is to look at this from the perspective of somebody who might see themselves in the psalm. In other words, they might recognise these words as reflecting their own experience in life. Maybe what do you say to somebody you know, somebody who's perhaps really close to you, who says that, that they recognise themselves in this? And I'm saying all this with great respect, personally speaking, and I hope humility, because I've never experienced anything like this myself, this black world that's described in Psalm 88. While it's entirely possible that somebody who is watching this will have done so, and they will recognise elements of, you will recognise elements of your own experience in this psalm. So in a way, what I'm saying is provisional because it's not my experience personally, but I hope that some of it will ring true and be helpful to you. Psalm 88 isn't just seen as shocking, but I think sometimes it's almost seen as an embarrassment in the kind of world where there's a neat transaction that can go on between God and people. So people can confess to some sin or whatever it may be, and then they can be restored in their relationship with God. And that's the kind of world that we're used to, which we expect, in which we expect things to happen. Um, but nothing like that happens in this psalm. That is the problem. It starts with these, this kind of urgent personal appeal where the writer Heman says, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear and hear my cry. This is common language in the Psalms. We're used to this kind of thing, where there is this, as I say, this expectation that God hears and answers, but not so here. Because Heman later on says, Why, Lord, why do you reject me and hide your face from me? And the Psalm is brutal about God's unresponsi un unresponsiveness. There's not even a tentative hint of an answer from God. It's all presented to God from the writer's perspective. And he says, I'm overwhelmed with trouble and my life draws near to death. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depths. It's all from the writer's perspective. There's never anything that comes back. We're never told why this is happening either. Is it maybe because there's some huge issue of guilt, some sin that might explain God's silence? There's maybe one verse that hints at something like that. He says, your wrath lies heavily on me. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. But it's not convincing. And mentioning God's wrath doesn't really supply, I don't think, a satisfactory answer for the total silence. And there may be shame and self-loathing going on here. He's lost all his closest friends who are now finding him repulsive. But there isn't much to go on, and most of us aren't psychiatrists anyway, so we can't really get much out of this. And when it comes to God himself, well, the psalm isn't interested in giving us sort of great theological reasons or some kind of justification for God. It just doesn't go there. The language in Psalm 88 does remind us of somebody else's story, though, and that's Job another character, another book in the Bible. But in many ways, Job experiences and amplifies what Heman, the psalm writer, is experiencing. Because in Job's case, life too has just gone appallingly wrong and he, he loses almost everything. Um, and he cries out over and over to God. And here's an example of how Job's language goes from chapter 3. Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in. For sighing has become my daily food, my groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me, what I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. But back to Psalm 88, and the absence of any answer doesn't silence the writer here. God's apparent deafness doesn't lead to his 
rejecting God, as we might expect in our kind of modern way, or walking away from God, which would be perhaps our modern idea of atheism, if anything, it leads to a greater intensity, because Hemond's worldview is completely wrapped up in the idea that God is there and God has to be addressed. In the end, God is the only person, being, who Haman can speak to. And one Jewish writer has said that in the Jewish world of faith, it's not possible for a serious Jew not to believe in God. But it's possible to believe against God. Notice the difference there. And that's what's happening here, I think. This is almost blasphemous, you could say, because God is meant to be good and dependable. And it's God who's meant to be our reliable friend, our constant friend, not darkness. But to say that darkness is my closest friend, going back to this idea of the psalmist in the end having to speak to God, isn't to deny God's existence. That would be a modern idea. Rather, it suggests that the author, Heman, has lost all confidence that God will help him. Now, Mark Maynell is an ordained minister. I've met him. He used to be on the staff team at All Souls Langham Place in London. And for many years, Mark has suffered debilitating depression. And at a certain stage, he decided to write about it and to publish the account of his experiences as a way of informing and helping other people. And not surprisingly, Mark has written about this very psalm in a book called When Darkness Seems My Closest Friend. And it's a book about which Mark says, I'm looking for the words and writing for those who can't imagine the words. One of the most amazing things about this psalm, according to Mark Maynell, is that it's been in the Jewish and then the Christian scriptures for around 3,000 years which means that God allows these words to be said. He, God allows them somehow to be in our Bible and in some mysterious way seems to want them to be said when and if people feel them and need to say them. But this, of course, doesn't mean that the despairing words about God are ultimately objectively true. There's a paradox here, really. Um, because, and Mark Maynell explains this, because Haman, the writer, expresses in prayer to God what it feels like to have no God at all. He prays in despair, and because of his despair, even though that seems like the last thing one should do if there's no God at work. So to my mind, Psalm 88 is unexpectedly one of the Bible's most liberating chapters. But the psalm does throw up difficult questions, and there's no obvious resolution in this psalm. But that's also important. We're left hanging over the pit with no obvious sign of rescue. But the thing is, life can be like that. Life can be like that. There's no button to press that will sort it all out. And our instinct to see things resolved whenever the situation is bad and see it is resolved as soon as possible. That's our instinct. But resolution doesn't always come soon. That's the reality. Many people will testify to that. Sometimes faith is kind of treated like the great answer book. And as Christians, we believe that to be true, don't we? Jesus Christ is the answer to the great questions of life. And he can, and he can only he can give us a secure future if we turn to him and trust him. But sometimes our future in Jesus is like looking through smoked glass. It's more like that. And for some people, it's like being abandoned in a black pit, at least some of the time. So this is part two of my talk. Uh, as I said at the very beginning, how do we respond when somebody we know, maybe somebody very close, is saying things like this? What do you say when your friend says to you, don't bother praying for me, God has given up on me, I don't think your prayers are doing any good, pray for somebody else. How do you respond? Well, the first thing I think is that we do keep praying, but we might not tell our friends there and then that we are praying still. And we don't try and justify 
our theological position. We don't come up with neat theological nuggets. We certainly don't do that. And going back to Mark Maynell, one of the worst things about depression, he says, is this kind of catch-22 situation that can arise because a, a sufferer just can't find the words to describe what's going on in their head. So their friends can't grasp and understand the situation. And then the one who has the depression becomes frustrated because they can't explain what it's like. And the one who cares feels inadequate because although they can sympathise, they can't empathise. And this all too easily ends in the caring friend either saying things that are received as glib and easy comments, or they're just frozen into a fearful silence because they just don't want to say the wrong thing. And there was a survey on friendship in, in the newspapers at one point and how to define friendship. And some interesting things came up. Among the best offerings were to say that a friend is one who understands our silence. There was one from C.S. Lewis who said, Friendship is born at the moment when a person says to another, What? You too? I thought I was the only one. Or, here's another good one, A friend is the first person who walks in when the whole world walks out. And before we go on to the, the final section of this, it's really important to say and to bear in mind that your friend, if your friend is using words like the words of Psalm 88, your friend might need professional help. And there's no harm and there's no failure in, admit, in admitting that. It's not an excuse to desert them either, of course. So final section, why is Psalm 88 here in the Bible at all? Why is it here? Well, I think it's here, and there must be a reason for it. And then there are two main reasons, I think. First, life can be like that. Life can be like that. And the Psalms speak about all of life, not just the good bits. Second, this isn't a psalm about muted depression. This is a psalm where the writer is in the depths of the pit, but it's still speech which is directed to God. And the writer's identity is in speaking to God. He has to keep speaking to God. God doesn't answer, but that's in the end a problem for God. His relationship with God is one for the times of blessing and fullness, but it's also for the times of silence. And all of this applies to us too. And of course, I pray that we don't slide into the pit as described here that we don't experience that. But all of us will at some point experience some sense of God's absence in our lives. And that's maybe when we or you will most appreciate a psalm like this. And maybe this is when you'll remember it and you'll turn to it and that you'll read Psalm 88. We've spoken already about Job, but there's another character in the Bible that I think we should mention here who is really important and significant and relevant to our looking at Psalm 88, and that's Jesus. We have to think about Jesus and the cross. We have to be careful and humble, though, at the same time, because we're going really quickly, and I don't want to be guilty of trotting out what can seem like easy solutions and explanations to what's happening in Psalm 88, kind of contradicting what I've already been saying earlier on. But I do think we need to look at Jesus. Because when Jesus was thinking about his journey of obedience to the cross, and even when he was on the cross, it must have been his imminent separation from his father through death that he feared most, even more than the unimaginable pain of being crucified. It was this imminent separation from his father. It's a mystery, but when you think about it, the Holy Trinity, the triune God, who's existed through eternity, was about to be torn apart when Jesus the Son died and descended into hell. And Psalm 88 
is in part a prophecy of this utter separation from the Father that Jesus was to experience for us, remember, on the cross, as he descended to the lowest pit and to the darkest depths, with his eyes, as the psalmist says, dim with grief. And darkness, in other words, darkness would become Jesus's closest friend. And this is a psalm that reminds us that the cross, among many things, includes the reality of Jesus's faithfulness at a time of complete abandonment. Because, as we were hearing last week when David was speaking about the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus begged to have the cup of suffering taken away, and yet he followed his Father's will. He was faithful. I think the very first verse in the psalm is key to this, where psalmist says, O Lord, the God who saves me, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. The God who saves me, Jesus must have clung to this as truth for himself. When he prayed in the garden, and when he was tried, and when he was flogged, and when he was nailed to the cross. The God who saves me, he must have hung on to that in that bleak psalm. And of course, Heman the psalmist was clinging to this as well. God was his only hope of salvation. God is the only hope for all of us as well, at the end of the day. And there are other veiled glimpses of this hope of God's love and salvation that are just about discernible in Psalm 88. I call to you, he says, Lord, I call to you every day. I spread out my hands to you. I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. There are just these veiled glimpses, these hints of this continued hope, which is there, even though darkness is his closest friend. Jesus knows what it is to be completely human. We say that very easily, don't we? Because we think of Jesus going to a wedding, drinking wine, turning water into wine. We think of him going fishing, we think of him getting hungry, all these ordinary things. But we forget maybe that Jesus' being completely human includes his knowing from personal experience what it means when somebody says, darkness is my closest friend. Jesus has been there too. He has been there. He really knows what it's like. He really does. And he knows us and he loves us, each of us fully. He knows and loves us better and more holistically than we know ourselves. But he knows us with a, an objectivity, objectivity that's impossible for us to achieve. He knows you and he loves you completely, whatever you experience. And I just want you to hang on to that because it's profound because you have to remember that he knows you and loves you whatever you experience. Spend a moment now just reflecting on that truth that Jesus knows you completely and deeply and ask yourself whether you've really grasped that. And now thank him. Thank him because he died for you on that cross. And he knows you. He knows who he died for. And you are his.
Lord, we come before you right now. We come before you and acknowledging, Lord, that you are so good and you're faithful to us. Lord, that you love us and you hear us. God, even in our suffering, even in our questioning, God, that you are so good. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And God, we praise you for that. We worship you and we honor you, Lord. And God, right now we want to bring before you all of those who are sick, all of those who are just really struggling at the moment, Lord. God, we pray, Father, would you come and relieve their pain right now in the name of Jesus? God, would you come and just heal them, Father? Would you show them that you are a God that is a healer? Would you show them that you are with them? Would you show them that you are good? God, we thank you that you are the great physician. And for those who are just really struggling in this lockdown, who are just done, God, would you just come and be with them right now in the name of Jesus? God, would you be their comfort in this time of pain and frustration? God, would you bring them joy where there just is no joy? Would you bring them hope in this time of hopelessness? And God, I pray... Um, for for the church lord for us in the church and especially for the leaders for will and for stephen and for for all those who are leading um these different churches lord i pray that you would give them wisdom and how to reach out into those who are really struggling right now god for those who are walking in depression god i just pray father that you would give them wisdom on how to reach them would you give them wisdom and how to lead these churches in this time father god i thank you for for the wisdom that you've given them so far. I thank you for the strategies and the understanding that you've given them so far. But Lord, we ask for more. We ask for the wisdom for more. And God, that when lockdown does cease, because it will one day, Lord, we thank you for the hope of that. And God, I just ask, Lord, that you give them wisdom on how to proceed at the end of lockdown and how to um, gather church once again. Um, God, I thank you for how we're gathering now virtually, but God, we ask for the wisdom how to do it physically. And so Lord, I pray that you give them that wisdom and that understanding. And God, I thank you for Alpha that's happening right now. We thank you for Alpha that's going on virtually, Lord God. What a great privilege it is and what an amazing opportunity it is for us to come and gather and just talk about you and talk about the Christian faith. But God, we need you in the midst of this. Lord, we need you so much. And so, Lord, I pray that you would um, bring understanding and wisdom to all the people um, who is helping to lead those sessions, Lord. God, would you come and be in the midst of these Alpha sessions, Lord. We really need you in the midst of these Alpha sessions. God, we need you to be present. We need you to um, show up, Lord. We need you to speak and move, Father. So, God, would you come? Would you reveal yourself as the only one, as a good Father, as a Holy Father, as the one who's always been there. And God, we thank you that you hear us when we cry out to you. We thank you, Lord, that you know us and you speak to us. And so, Lord, I pray also for these vaccinations that are going out. Um, Lord, I thank you for the people um, that have been vaccinated and that have wanted to get vaccinated. And God, I pray for those who are still waiting and that they are wanting to get the vaccination. Lord, I pray that you would continue to keep them safe, Lord. And for all of those who are distributing the vaccinations, Lord, I pray that you would keep them safe as they do so. And Lord, I pray that you give the give wisdom to the doctors and the nurses and all the NHS staff and all of those who are in charge of all these different things, Lord. I just pray that you would give them um, just understanding and strategies and wisdom and, and knowledge of how to do this in the right way, in a safe way, Lord. God, I thank you for how you've been with us through this whole pandemic this last year. God, I thank you that you haven't left us once. And that you are God that sees it all and understands it all, even more than we ever will and will ever understand. And that, God, we can trust you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to trust you. You would help us to know you a bit more so that we can trust you some more. And so, Lord, where we're struggling right now, Lord, I just pray that you go to the depths of our heart. Help us to 
yeah, to give up those, those places, Lord, that still don't, don't trust you, Lord, so that we can come to a better place of knowing you and trusting in you, Father. And God, I thank you that with you, Lord, we are okay. And that no matter what happens, no matter our circumstances, that with you, we are okay. So Lord, I just pray that you would continue to speak to us, continue to strengthen us, and continue to show us what, what it is that you are doing, Lord. And show us that you love us no matter what. Because you are a good God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus, thank you that you're with us in everything. Thank you that you are a God who is always at work in our lives, always wanting to do a work of renewal in us. And I pray you just help us to be attentive to that and to hear what you're doing, even in the place of difficulty and even in the place of suffering. We need you. We love you. We trust you. And I pray that you will help us to see what you're doing in our life ever more clearly this week, I pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining us. Really good to have you all with us. Do join us um, if you're able for our kind of Zoom chat in just a minute. The link for that is on our email. If you're not on our emails, you can sign up by a link just below in the video description because we would love to link you up with all that we've got going on. Um, but have a fantastic week and we will see you very soon. Bye.